One of the things that interests me, that fascinates me, is the the sharing of responsibility. Because in our cult, we've conflated responsibility with blame and punishment. In other words, are you responsible for this accident has come to mean, are you going to be blamed and then punished? as opposed to, are you capable of responding to this accident? And of course, who wants to be blamed and punished? Uh, who wants to be powerful? Because power is correlated with response ability. What is power? Power is influence. How do you influence something? By responding to it. If you cannot respond or will not respond, you have no power because you have no influence. So are you responsible? Do you want any power? Now, another thing that you know, is, is really important on a physics level is, uh, is mass. The law of mass dictates that whenever two objects collide, that when a bowling ball collides with a pinball, you know, a bowling ball is about this size, a pinball is about this size. When a bowling ball collides with a, a pinball, the pinball goes flying, the bowling ball continues absorbing the energy of the pinball, sharing some of its energy, but continuing on its original trajectory, simply because it's so many times bigger, it's, it's hard to tell that there was an interaction if you're looking at the bowling ball. But if you're looking at the pinball, you've got a scatter pattern where the life of that pinball is never going to be the same. It's sent off in perhaps a 180 degree uh, pivot uh, off into a different probability field, a different trajectory. That's the law of mass. Now, the law of mass and morality and intelligence are not correlated meaning the pinball may have been heading in the right direction. You know, it just depends on the question and, and the answer to the question. If the goal or the question was, what's the closest way to the ocean? And the answer was that way, and the pinball was going that way, uh, it's not wrong. The fact that it collides with a bowling ball and moves off in a 180 degree variance with its original and accurate and intelligent trajectory is the law of mass. So the law of mass leads to things such as momentum, the maintenance of the status quo. There's mass in motion. There's energy in a pattern in motion. And it takes energy to interrupt that energy and change the pattern. And if there isn't enough energy available, then the status quo continues. Now, the trouble with the status quo in every case is that it is suboptimal. You can pick any area, the transportation system, the healthcare system, the political system. These are all large masses of energy that have momentum and have a status quo. the prison system, 
the chauvinism of a cult, the racism of a cult. These are large patterns of energy that are in formation and have momentum. And it's going to take a large pattern of energy in formation with momentum to first of all dissipate and slow down the momentum of racism and then reverse its impact and damage to slow down the inefficiencies, the unconsciousness, the stupidities within the education system and reverse those and move towards a trajectory that is more intelligent as measured by the fact that the current system yields X units of sustainable human well-being per unit of time, money, and natural resource invested in the system. And the optimal system yields 10 times more sustainable well-being per unit of time, money, and natural resources. Now, one of the foundations of the American identity is a slogan or a meme. It's not my problem. Another one, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. It's not my problem. I didn't do it. And these are useful for children to kind of step outside the, the, the probable field of blame and punishment. However, they're not useful for adults who want to participate in the momentum of their cult or culture towards 10x living, towards 10x intelligence, towards delivering 10 more units of sustainable well-being for themselves and others per unit of time, money, and natural resources invested to create a new status quo. Now, the Ever Given, as I make this video in 2021, uh, has just been freed from the Panama Canal. Uh, the Ever Given, a large container ship hit with 60 miles per hour winds as it was moving sideways through the canal, pivoting so that the bulbous aspect of its, uh, you know, its bulkhead, uh, its, its hull, nosed into the sand. Uh, and, you know, carrying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of tons, it pushed about 45 feet into the sandbar. Then the wind blew the back of the Ever Given in to block the Panama Canal. Now the Panama Canal is in the process of constantly being dredged and maintained. It's a, it's a synthetic passage that was engineered to bypass the uh, the, 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 you know, having to go all the way around South America, etc. And the funding for the Panama Canal comes in the form of, let's say, average $400,000 payments for boats to move through the canal. So the Ever Given and, you know, various boats pay the owners of the Panama Canal $400,000 to take their ship through the passage. 
Now, when the ever given was kind of turned into a, a large wedge, uh, nothing was on hand capable of pulling it out. You know, you can't call it a tow truck for a uh, 500,000 ton vehicle out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and yet, for every hour that it was wedged into the canal, uh, the global economy was losing hundreds of millions of dollars in delayed shipments. And the canal uh, owners were losing 450 thousand uh, dollars an hour minimum. A large line of boats stuck waiting for the ever given to be unwedged. Now, you could say, well, whose fault was it? And let's just say it was Joe Black. Joe Black made a mistake, and uh, so let's leave it to Joe to get himself out of the fix. You made your bed, Joe, now lie in it. Well, the problem with so many of our crises, personal or national or otherwise, is that Joe, working 10 hours a day, you know, conscientious Joe, you know, is going to get out his shovel and he's going to dig out, you know, the, the, the boat. Um, you know, he could work to try and free this boat for the next 40 years and fail. And everyone could look around and say, it's not my problem. I didn't do it. But at some level, if you want power, if you want to have a better reality, it doesn't matter if you did it. It doesn't matter if it's your fault. It doesn't matter uh, if in the euphemisms for fault and blame and punishment, it doesn't matter if you say you're not responsible. Because the truth is, in most cases, we are all able to respond to something. If we are aware of it and if we prioritize it, we are able to respond. And when no one wants to take the helm, when no one wants to own their power, their ability to respond to a given situation, then you have a dynamic where, let's say there's a few people that will respond, but do you know what it took to get the ever given out of the sandbar? It took two enormous excavator diggers on the front. And it took somewhere between 10 and 20 separate tugs. And it took unloading some of the fuel and liquid out of the boat. So we're lifting, we're, we're, we're raising the boat, and it took waiting for the best tide. So it took the moon. Now, was it the moon's fault? You see, it doesn't matter. The moon responded. The moon moved over this region of the earth, and with it, the water following the gravitational pull of the moon moved towards the ever given, moved towards the canal, and the water rose. The diggers removed some of the hundreds of thousands of pounds of friction 
and the tugs, uh, you know, each capable of moving some tens of thousands of pounds of, of weight each, were able to free up the canal. Now, if there had not been a concerted global response, who can help? How can we get this done? Tremendous amounts of harm can come to someone in Hawaii who needs a medical shipment that can't get through the canal. I didn't do it. I'm not responsible. Well, who is able and willing to respond in a situation where it takes many? Now, the key thing to understand in the differentiation between blame and punishment and the ability and willingness to respond is that depending on the mass of energy, depending on the pattern and its mass, it requires an equal or larger volume and pattern of energy to absorb the energy that's coming from the bowling ball and dissipate it and redirect it. If you have a pinball, it's not going to do the job. It'll do the job of sending the pinball flying it's not going to stop the bowling ball. Now, we all have some idea about an ideal. We all have, that's why it's called an ideal. I have a deal. I have a vision that things should be like this. People should be healthier, the air should be cleaner, whatever it is. We have an ideal, uh, some vision that we value. And because we have a lot in common, uh, there uh, many parts of our, our ideals are similar. M few of us have an ideal of an air filled with smog of water laced with arsenic, of uh, excruciating pain and groans all around us. Um, you know, few, few of us are that sadistic and masochistic that we dream of the ultimate torment of ourselves and other people. But we do share the desires for sustainable well-being for ourselves and others. And it's not that hard to measure. How happy are you in this area of your life, in this area of your life, in this area of your life? Why? Is it a sustainable happiness? I mean, you may be enjoying a pleasure cruise, but if you're doing it at 23% interest on credit card debt, with minimal chance of paying the card off in the next year, that short-term pleasure isn't sustainable. Whether or not it is ecologically, it's not sustainable financially over time. Uh, and if you don't pay your debts back, your rates go up and your options for borrowing go down. So it's not sustainable that way, and if you do pay it back, if you end up suffering for a year to pay for a week of, of uh, dissociative pleasure, it's not sustainable well-being. The point is that it took an energy mass that was equal or greater than the friction than the mass of the ever given before it was dislodged. And several billion dollars of impact 
in the global economy was accrued. Several billion dollars of cost was accrued until enough people cooperated to shift that mass of energy back on track and let it proceed through the canal. And people responded. People responded with ideas all around the world to make that happen. And so it did. But if no one responded, or let's imagine that half of the tugboats showed up, that rather than plus 10 tugboats, we had four tugboats. Four tugboats showed up. The four tugboats could have pulled on the hull for a thousand years and not done what 10, 15 tugboats did in a few hours. And so in the shift and in the looking at responsibility, the ability and the willingness to respond, the real question is what kind of world do we want to live in? Are we able and are we willing to respond? And what does it look like? What is our response and what's the impact of our response? And if we understand that asking an individual to lift 100,000 pounds alone is the equivalent of saying we want to live in a world where this never changes. But if a thousand people each lift a hundred pounds, it can be moved in an hour. You have a hundred thousand pounds and something needs to be lifted off. Let's say there's a nursery of children being crushed and suffocated under a hundred thousand pound weight. It needs to be lifted, it needs to be carried, it needs to be set down. A thousand people can do it in less than an hour, in five minutes. But one person, however much they try, cannot address this in a hundred thousand years with the strength of their own body. And so while cults construct barriers that dissociate us from one another. It's one of the symptoms of insanity, the one of the symptoms of dis-ease, is these artificial schizophrenic partitions. That's not my family. That's not my business. That's not my responsibility. I didn't do it. I'm not at fault. As we partition and dissociate you know, from large groups of people around us, from their well-being, from their pain, and the impact of dissociating from them, the impact of not responding in a sufficient matter, ma matter capable of pivoting the weight, We are investing in a future of chronic failure, of chronic suffering, of the mediocrity of the status quo. Now, when the Ever Given ran aground, uh, there were physics majors, students of force and dynamics, that were able to remotely diagnose and calculate 
the number of tons of force that would be needed to extricate this giant ship from its wedge in the canal. You know, we need 450 tons of force, pulling power, in order to have the needed impact. We need this, we need that, and well, we can't get 450 tons of force, so how could we uh, reduce that friction? Well, we need to, you know, export uh, 100,000 gallons of oil. So we need to bring an oil tanker up. We need to put 100,000 gallons of oil or diesel into the, you know, a boat. So we're going to lift the boat. We're going to reduce the friction at, to a point where we have just enough tugs at a high tide point to extricate the boat. But what's required is to be literate in the map of physicality. Physics is the science of physicality. And science is the art of prediction through numbers. It's the art of creating probability fields that lead to a narrative that helps us predict if we do this, will it be successful? If we do that, will it be successful? And we call it scientifically, or we, we call it a scientific uh, theory or a scientific approach, if a proposition is hypothesized to produce a given result, number one. Number two, if doing that creates the results, and if the results can be re verified repeatedly, then we consider it a movement from uh, a scientific theory into a scientific paradigm or formula or uh, basis in, in fact. And so this is our, our, our quote, grounding, our, our test of science, which is does it work? Does it work predictably? Does this pattern, this formula, this theory, this narrative allow me to have consistent, predictable results in the area that is relevant. In this case, we measured the weight of the vessel. We measured the gravitational field. We measured the friction in the sand. We measured how deep it was into the sand. We measured the wind. We measured the thrust capacity of the tugboats. And if we have a sound theory and an understanding of what's going on, we should be able to predict what is necessary in order to solve the problem, to change the future to a better one, a future where flow and global commerce resumes. And we call it a science because they were right. They did successfully restore the flow of global commerce using predictable, measurable methods that would work again in similar circumstances and have worked in the past. Now, this science, the science of physics, is really the science of energy and momentum in formation and it's applied in the outer world. Now, the trouble with chauvinism, chauvinism is the polarity, it is the division of the universe into polarity, yin and yang, masculine and feminine, male and female, good and bad, black and white. It is 
the polarizing of all that is into two parts. Because when you understand the nature of polarity, then the male-female dynamic, for example, which tends to be focused on culturally, is a microcosm, is a fractal representation of masculine and feminine energy, which is a microcosmic representation of all polarity. You know, you have the form and you have the essence. You have the wave and you have the particle. And so if it's really true that masculinity is better than femininity, is superior in some way, innately, that men are better than women innately, that if that's really true, then it means speaking is more important than listening. And many chauvinists live that way, talking without listening, because it's better to talk, leading without following, because it's better to lead. But chauvinism collapses under the weight of science because it's unfounded in data. Meaning a communication scientist cannot make a case that speaking is better than listening. Because if everyone spoke and no one listened, there would be no communication. Now, similarly, the scientist in reverse chauvinism could not make a case that listening was better than speaking. Because if everyone listened and no one spoke, there would be no communication. Now, you can pull that apart and say, oh, there would be body language and observation. Okay, if no one moved their body at all, and everyone was listening for body language, is that terribly useful? No, the, the, the synergy, the full potential of our ecology and our reality is realized, is unleashed in the synergy between speaking and listening in equality, between leading and following in equality, between initiating and responding. You know that feeling, hey, you want to go to the beach? That's masculine, that's initiating. If everyone says no, there's no flow. Hey, you want to do this? No. You want to do this? No. Initiation without response is as valueless as speaking without listening, as listening with no one talking. You need someone to say, how about it? And you need someone to say, okay, let's do it. In order for energy to move. You need someone to speak and you need someone to listen for communication to occur. You need someone to teach and someone to open, to learn, to respond, or there is no education. Teachers are meaningless without students. Parenting without children is meaningless. So when you really understand the geometry of polarity, you understand that the science is clear. One half of reality is the same, is as equal as the other half of reality. In chauvinism, we study the outer forces, but neglect the inner forces. Because the ever given 
being wedged by a gust of wind, stopping the world's shipping supply, is a fractal pattern. It's a disruptive phenomena. Now, because it's out there, because we study physical science, people knew how to solve it and knew what was right and what was wrong and had informed opinions. More importantly, the people with the most competency were brought onto the scene. And hundreds of thousands of tons of energy was maneuvered effectively and flow was restored. All chemistry is flow. When you have a broken marriage, when you have a lack of sexual chemistry, you have an imbalance, you have a toxic imbalance, you have a lack of flow between the masculine and the feminine, between the yin and the yang, the inner and the outer. in the relationship. Because when there is multidimensional flow, the sex is good. When there is multidimensional friction, so you don't get flow when two people are talking. You don't get flow when two people are listening. You don't get flow when two people are leading or two people are waiting to be led you get flow. When one person says, how about it? And the other says, yes. You get flow. When one person speaks and the other lets it in in a meaningful way. You get flow when one person says, I feel sad. And the other person says, tell me all about it. I want to know all the details. And more importantly, I want to respond. Not as a sociopath, it's not my fault, it's not my problem, it's not my job, it's not mine, you deal with it. Not as a sociopath, but as an empath that says, let's hold a container together. Let's take this undigestible lump that's stuck in your maw, that's stuck in your mouth, that's not passing through the digestive system of one body. Let's break it up into bite-sized pieces. Even a black forest cake with the most delicious fresh organic garnishes becomes sickening, becomes toxic if it is forced into one mouth too quickly without attuning to the digestive capacity of the body and the various continuums in the body, sugar levels uh, and energy levels, you know, and the like, the mass. And it is starvation. You give one millimeter by one millimeter to a starving person, you have toxicity. If you give one ton of chocolate cake to one person, you have toxicity. You have a lack of regulation. Great sex occurs with attunement. When the energy is matched to the other's energy, when it's matched multidimensionally, mentally, emotionally, and physically, when both people are in integrity, when both people are integrated mentally, emotionally, and physically. Because if I want it now, and I don't want a mistake, and I don't know what I'm doing, you're either going to get it now, and because you don't know what you're doing, you're going to make a mistake, or you're not going to get it now, and then you're going to learn what you're doing and you'll make fewer mistakes. But if I want to have it now and I don't want to make mistakes and I don't know what I'm doing, 
I'm disintegrated. There's no way for me to win. Because if I were to take three years to become masterful in this domain, playing the violin, stopping cardiac, cardiac arrest, doing brain surgery, if I was to study masterfully for three years, and there was an emergency, an urgency, and I said, quick, put them on the table, open them up, let's do it now. Then I can have all three. I can do it now and not have mistakes because I took the three years to become competent, to become masterful in this terrain. But if I didn't, I don't want to make mistakes Okay, so then you have to study and become competent. Yeah, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to make mistakes, but I'm too lazy to do what it would take to not make mistakes. So I don't want to make mistakes, and I don't want to do the work so that I don't make mistakes. So you have disintegration. You have an inner conflict. Now, that's going to be resolved one way or another. If my laziness ranks higher in my value hierarchy than my, I don't want to make mistakes, then I don't learn anything, and I still don't want to make mistakes, but I'm going to make mistakes if I engage in that domain. If I attempt brain surgery without the training, I'm going to kill him. Oh darn, I forgot to... This one scalpel, I just forgot to sterilize it. I was so close. Another one dead. You know, the, the surgeons before germs were discovered through microscopes were adamant that they were doing it correctly and actually sent the discoverer of germs to an insane asylum because he suggested that doctors were killing their patients by the thousands by not washing their hands, by touching corpses, and then delivering babies, and then rendering themselves, I didn't do it, it's not my fault, I'm not responsible, meaning I'm not able and willing to respond. You know, radical materialism, if we can't see it, it doesn't exist, well, before the microscope, the doctors couldn't see germs. And they were dedicated to their dogma. I mean, that's supposed to be the differentiating fact between doctors and scientists, or between scientists and dogmatists, is that the scientist is supposed to look at the data. And the data was that a lot of mothers and children were dying after spending time giving birth in the hospital. And the statistics were lower for those who couldn't afford hospital treatment. Before germ theory was accepted in the paradigm of medical care, it, you were safer away from a doctor than you were in a hospital. But the, the dogma that says if, if these eyes can't see it, it doesn't exist because that's the pillar of science. No more mysticism, no more mystery. We're going on facts, i.e. what my eye can see, led to the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of women and children sacrificed to the dogma that would put an observant person in an, in an insane asylum, would drum him out of the business for saying, you know what, we may not know why, but the fatality rate goes down if you'll wash your hands. Please wash your hands. Look at the data. 
We may not yet know why, but will you put the lives of your patients ahead of your dogma, ahead of your arrogance? The answer was no. We're going to keep killing our patients until we have the evidence that we are doing it. And in the politics of science, then you have to keep killing patients again until the scientists and the chief of hospital and the doctors who rejected the data have retired because we wouldn't want them to have a bad reputation. And so even though we now understand that we're killing our patients, we can't, it would be too embarrassing to talk about it. So we'll bring it up after the people who denied germ ther therapy have retired, after it doesn't uh, ruffle too many feathers. And we'll just be hospitals taking money to kill people uh, to protect the image of our deities, the head of the hospital, the, the one with the greatest PhDs. So where does this all come in? You know, what's, what's interesting about this? Well, one of the interesting dynamics is the way we as a cult, we as a community, we as the Human Awareness Institute community respond to sexual abuse and trauma in the community. What happens when a Peter Sandhill sexually abuses his client under the influence of psychedelics, then denies the abuse, then insists on charging money for the abuse? then shames and blames his patient for having symptoms of the abuse. And what happens when the patient brings this to the attention of the board of directors, brings this to the attention of the entire facilitator body? And because it would be embarrassing for the Human Awareness Institute to be sexually abusing its clients for money, the patient is asked to go insane. Not necessarily put into an insane asylum, that can come later, but is asked to go insane with the assertion that this must be kept silent for your benefit. What happens when the authority figures in our community, in our group, do not want to ruffle the feathers of the peers who refer them clients, do not want to be denied access to the sexual pleasure within a network of power, within a network of relationships, do not want to own and respond to a crisis that when a large force hits an individual and sends them off course so that they wedge into a very small canal in the psyche and energy builds up and energy builds up and it can't pass through and there's a tremendous loss of flow there's a tremendous loss in energy movement in growth because a large wind tilted the vessel to one side and wedged it but when it came for the tugboats to help pull that out, when it came for the diggers to help, when it came for the media to draw attention, because one of the technologies that facilitated the rapid response to the Ever Given was transparency. 
by having a free press rather than a control and domination shame-based secrecy protocol. Because of course, maybe the captain of the Ever Given didn't want to be on the news as being the one that slowed down the economy. Maybe Evergreen, which a big shipping company, didn't want to be associated and have its logo as the one that slowed down global shipping. Maybe the designers of the ship didn't want their ship on the news. Maybe the dredgers of the canal who'd said, now nah, we don't need to dredge that part better. You know, we can manage. There hasn't been a disaster yet. Maybe they didn't want the spotlight turned on their decision and its impact. Maybe the large logging companies don't want any connection made between the volatility of weather and wind and their logging activities. There's a lot of people that do not want to be punished, do not want to be criticized in a culture whose primary response to mistakes and dysfunction is to scapegoat a small minority wedge and then apply pain and blame and ostracization to them in the ancient tradition of scapegoating. In the ancient tradition of scapegoating, a village that was beset with chronic bad luck, with strong patterns of suffering, would project parent onto the universe. And since parenting for a good number, for some thousands of years, since parenting in Western cults is the cult of punishment, of scapegoating, of asking the child to do more than the parent, to blame the child, to shame the child. When you project parent on the universe, if you're an Egyptian or one of the chosen ones, it's, I must have done something wrong, so that's why I'm being punished. Because that's the psyche, that's the mythology of every wounded child in a traumatically illiterate cult. You're incompetent, and so you're hurting me, the child. I can't deal with facing the truth that I depend on a sociopathic incompetent cult that produces sociopathic and incompetent parents. I can't deal with that. And so I'm going to create an alternate narrative that I can deal with that doesn't threaten the power structure that I depend on to survive and feel secure and experience love and belonging, which is that I'm bad and that if you've hurt me, I deserved it because I'm bad. Now, it's a little bit of a shaky proposition. I'm bad. Okay, so I deserve to be hurt. That's an interesting one. I'm bad, so maybe I deserve to be healed. That'd be a source of great abundance, wouldn't it? More healed members of the cult? No, 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 no. You're bad, so you need to be hurt. How's that going to help anyone? Well, you're bad because you hurt these people. Maybe you hurt their property and that hurts their feelings. 
they have hurt feelings. We're in a traumatically illiterate cult. We're in an emotionally illiterate cult. These people do not know what to do with their hurt feelings. They didn't have those hurt feelings before you stole their cow. Now they've got hurt feelings and no cow. And they would feel better if you were hurt too. Because then they can watch their hurt being moved over to you. Because they don't know what to do with their hurt. They don't know how to get rid of it. They don't know how to heal it. They certainly don't know about forgiveness. How would you learn forgiveness from an Old Testament, Testament bastard who punishes people for all eternity? You're not going to learn mercy from that guy. So where is this going to come from? I'm hurt. I want to give some of my hurt to you. If you're feeling hurt as well, I will feel better because I don't know what else to do with it. I don't want to carry it. You gave it to me, and now I want to give it back to you. The trouble is, of course, in an emotionally illiterate cult that once you give the hurt back to them, they don't know what to do with it either. If they knew what to do with their hurt so that they could feel happy and let go of it, they wouldn't have stolen your cow. But they didn't know what to do with their hunger, with their poverty, with their hurt. So they took some of your success. If they knew how to create their own cow and not go to prison, they might have done that. But they didn't. At some level, they had more faith in theft than in peasants rising the corporate ladder or whatever it was at the time. So we have this movement. Now, to the degree that a cult is in pain, is in chronic and unnecessary suffering, is to the degree that it is incompetent. How do we know this? All human beings in the history of humanity have wanted to feel sustainably better and wanted to avoid feeling chronically worse. And they started out clean, right? Their mother didn't feed them enough stuff. They screamed. Their mother didn't bond and give them enough oxytocin. They screamed. They expected mother to know how to parent without a single hour of parenting, with a chauvinistic paradigm that doesn't train mothers or pay mothers to do one of the most important responsibilities in the survival of a species. The child expected the cult to be intelligent. And so they screamed, an intelligent cult would know what to do, but they didn't do it. Instead, they hid the child away. If you're screaming, you're going in the other room. So once the child learned that telling the truth and just asking directly for what I need isn't working, the baby still needs to meet their human needs. Now they have to figure out an adaptive strategy. They have to map out the body language and patterns of behavior in their caregivers and in their cults to try and figure out how the fuck am I going to survive, feel secure, experience love and belonging, meet, get self-esteem, develop my gifts, bring those gifts abundantly into the world and become part of something bigger. How am I going to do that? with these sociopathic dysfunctional people who hit me when I tell them this truth and that truth and give them feedback. So does lying work? Does stealing work? And so the, 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 the infant, the child, the adolescent, the grown-up, the uninitiated adult, the grown-up, figures out what method, what adaptive strategy what synthetic coping mechanism 
gets at least some of their needs met in a paradigm where the people are so incompetent that large segments of the population are not even at love and belonging. They're barely surviving, they're insecure in their survival, and they have very low levels of love and belonging, very low levels of self-esteem. They don't know what their gifts are. There's few opportunities to develop them. As a result, there is not a massive influx of competency. And as a result, there isn't a massive influx of abundance. And as a result, there's tremendous scarcity. And scarcity leads to trauma and violation and separation and dissociation. Because when there's only one carrot and two children are hungry, one of them is going to go without a carrot. And if you feel for the other person, if you love the other person, you will feel their suffering. You will understand their hatred, their jealousy. They need their human needs to be met as much as you. But it's not going to happen because the competency is too low to create the abundance so that every human being can meet their human needs. Not their delusions of grandeur and fantasies, not their ten mansions, their needs to survive, to feel secure in the next meal, in a safe place to, sh to sleep in medical care. Millions, tens of millions of Americans do not have that. They have not reached level two. They're in survival, insecure of that survival. They don't even know what love is. They don't have a cogent definition of love. They may have a cross-wired abuse definition of love. They don't know how to parent. They don't know what friendship is. They don't know how to be a good friend. They don't know how to find a good friend. They feel alone. They may have some inkling of their talent and it's actively discouraged. It's not developed into a floodgate of generosity and, and abundance into the community, into the world. No one's tracking it. Do you realize not a single person in my entire life, anywhere on this planet, in tens of thousands of conversations, has shown an active pointed interest in what my talent is and or in supporting that talent. Now, if you look closely, and I'm not talking about training you to do a job. Every boss is interested in extracting as much money as possible from their employees. But if your real talent is playing the saxophone, is there a boss that's interested in that? What do you do in a cult of scarcity? Because in order to disown and dissociate and say it's not my problem, you have to shut off the region of the brain that gives us our humanity, the empathic brain. You have to go to sleep. And what awakens and what remains is the reptilian brain. Fight what is smaller, run from what is bigger, freeze when neither of those options are available. No feelings, positive or negative. Dissociative numbness. You're in survival, and the reptilian brain can help you survive. It just can't help you be a human being because it's not the human part of the brain. Someone who has been traumatized into a level of pain that is so high 
that their empathic brain shuts down is no longer a human being. They have been reduced by the incompetence of their cult into a reptile in a paradigm of scarcity with little or no compassion and love for themselves or other people. Just a strong fight, flight, freeze dynamic in a profound paradigm of scarcity, of incompetence, and of pain. All fear is the fear of pain in the past that did not get integrated, that did not get healed, that did not get understood, repeating itself, as it is likely to do. Because if there was no competence in the entire cult to stop the child trauma from happening, number one, and number two, there was no competence in the entire cult to heal the trauma that did happen. And number three, when the wound was actively buried to protect the reputation and the feelings of shame in the abuser who had the power and the purse strings. See, this is the trouble when a parent takes their child to a psychologist. You get a great report with all the fancy labels. Your child has, your child has, your child has, not your family has. Because if the child has nightmares, the family has terrorism. We're not talking bad and needing to be punished. If the child is dissociative, the family contains the diagnosis of traumatizing. What is in the particle is in the environment. You see a gardener, when they see a dead shriveled rose, does not diagnose the rose. A gardener has faith in the innate drive of the rose to live. The gardener diagnoses the environment. If there's a dead shriveled rose, what does a gardener look at? I'll tell you. Number one, was there enough light for this rose? Oh, there's the problem. It's under the deck. It isn't getting a single minute of direct sunlight in the day. So, well, the problem is roses need several hours of direct sunlight. Now, if it had been an algae or a fern, it would be doing fine here, but you put a rose under your deck. The rose didn't try and grow there. You put it there. There's nothing wrong with the rose. There's something wrong with the competency of a gardener that would put a rose under a deck. Next, let's look at the soil. Is there enough organic matter? Is there enough nitrogen? Roses bloom, particularly the hyper-developed engineered roses uh, sought after in cut flower arrangements. They consume tremendous amount of fertilizer, but you have none. This is rocky clay soil that's not received. Roses need water. Your soil is bare. Now, to spend a single moment questioning the desire to live of the rose or the innate health of the rose is a mistake. If you want to understand what will be necessary for the next rose to thrive, put it in the sun, give it adequate water, 
mulch it appropriately, give it fertilizer, give it drainage, it'll do just fine on its own. Life wants to evolve, wants to win. When it's not doing that, when a child is withering, when a child is turning anaerobic and toxic, it has little or nothing to do with the child. But will a parent pay a psychologist to diagnose their incompetencies? Well, what are you doing to terrorize this child? We have to spend some time with you. I'm not going to pay you to make me look good at a parent. Here, I'm going to find someone who's going to tell me what's wrong with my child. I didn't come here for a lesson on parenting. I'm perfectly comfortable with my own incompetence and profound parental ignorance by willfully participating in a cult where you can go cradle to grave without a single scientific hour of formal parental training. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of my ignorance, proud of my stupidity. We have a long history in this family of traumatizing our children, makes them tough. Of course, putting a rose in the shade doesn't make a rose tough. It leads to withering. But if you're a brutal household, you can always rip the rose up and put another one in and threaten it. I'm not going to give you any water till you show some signs of progress like your other rose that's out in the sun there. Come on, you can do it. So, are we able and willing to respond to the pain in our environment, to the ignorance in our environment, to the chauvinism in our environment? Or do we prefer the cult meme of a head in the sand? It's not my fault. I didn't do it. Now, I watched several of my therapists collude in secrecy and shame, insanity, and silence to tip my boat into the sandbar. And I found to my horror that I could not get myself out. That the people I had hired and learned from and chosen as my teachers had influenced a pivot into the reef, into the sandbar, and the flow that had been occurring to whatever degree it had been occurring stopped financially, stopped emotionally, stopped communally as email accounts were shut down so that these truths could not be known within the Human Awareness Institute community, as I was told to be silent. What would it take to turn a life back into flow? You see, you have to measure the wound. You have to measure the impact of going adrift on the sandbar. And you have to involve enough people to pull it off so that it can sail again. It doesn't take a lot of time. It takes a lot of force, about the same amount of force as it takes to send the ship off course in the first place. And it causes damage. 
everyone is affected in the vicinity in a microcosm and in a macrocosm. Obviously, when one person goes adrift and, in this case, develops symptoms of PTSD, rage, compulsiveness, dissociative, obviously, when that occurs with one person, it affects the people in their life. It may have less direct impact on those responsible for the the push, maybe they moved on. But to some degree, the ecology is blocked until enough energy with enough intelligence is brought to bear and a person can sail on with their lives. This cannot happen when the agendas of fear, shame, secrecy, and silence for the abuser, for the incompetent, for the leader, for a public nonprofit. This cannot happen when the agendas of silence, insanity, avoiding punishment and pain, etc., are louder, are more important than the response ability, the ability and willingness to respond, to put the patient first, to put the client first. Because how could you get all those tugboats to come to the Ever Given if it was all covered up? You see, as soon as the news is out there and a tugboat's in the general area, they say, oh, they need some help. I'll head over that way so I can lend a hand. And the flow of global shipping is restored. Now, let's pivot to play devil's advocate for a little bit. Because one of the big games in our cult is scapegoating. You know, this began when, when, to finish that story, these people feel that they've done something wrong but don't know what it is, feel that God is an angry dad because that's what they can relate to, feel like dad is punishing them because that's what they can relate to, and so God is causing them suffering. The chosen people are wandering in the desert for 40 years because they've done something wrong, because they must deserve to be tested, to be punished. By the almighty sadist, by the almighty torturer. You know, how long can you stay alive, my chosen people? Oh, you haven't all died in one year in a desert? Well, let's give you another year. Sally is about 70. I'm sure she'll pass off in the next 10. 40 years in a desert. You're already 50 years old. It's rather, you're already old. Getting near your end of your life span 2,000 years ago. Just Keep with me. Once you're dead, then you can be brought to the promised land. My sense is it took six people to help me lift the weight that I couldn't lift alone. Six people, a matter of hours. Dane, how can I help? What do you need? How can I help? It's not hard, but this, we're in taboo terrain. The reptilian brain has no connection to anything other than indirect selfish interest. It's in survival. The reptilian brain is not interested in help. It'll negotiate in a scarcity mentality. I'll give you this if you give me that. The reptilian brain is not interested in how can I help, what do you need. 
the reptilian brain, it's not my problem. Helping you is not going to help me survive tomorrow. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. We leave our people to wither in states of high grief, overwhelming trauma, and PTSD, to starve to death emotionally, mentally, and physically, rather than lend a hand for a few hours with six people. And we protect those at the top of the power structure. And scapegoat. The term for scapegoating came for in this frenzy of suffering of how can we blame and appease? What did we do wrong that God sent this thunderstorm, that Mary died of cholera, that we're still in the desert after another year? What can we do? God is angry. Someone has to suffer. I don't want it to be me. I know, says one person, why don't we blame the goats? Maybe God would be satisfied if one of the goats was punished severely because God is quite angry. And we would be suffering too because, you know, we need meat and goat milk. We would be suffering and the goat would be suffering. So maybe God, the ultimate sociopath, would be satisfied if we really hurt the goat and then we also ate and had less of a goat herd ourselves. So we would all be suffering and God will be happy, says the abused child in a trauma illiterate cult. So they go into the family of goats and they have to pick one. There's Charlie, there's Billy. What is it, do they draw lots? Oh, Billy, you're gonna be the scapegoat. Billy gets dragged out in his horns. And they say, this, we are gonna punish this goat. And hopefully the Lord will be less sociopathic next year than he was last year. Since this is all part of his plan, we have nothing to do with it. It's not our fault. We didn't do it. It's God doing it. And he's obviously pissed because, uh, you know, we're in worse shape at the end of this year than we were the year before. So we're going to have to sacrifice another goat. We could use the meat, but we can't upset the big bastard in the sky. So, Billy, stand here. Don't move. We've all got to throw rocks at you. Uh, you know, it's moving again. Tie him down. Stone the goat. Throw a bunch of rocks at the goat. You know, God will presumably be gratified by all the squealing and blood and bruising of this goat. And then get out of here, Billy. You know, go out in the desert. We never want to see you again. God, you know, I hope you're satisfied. We've suffered. And Billy, well, he's not going to make it through the night. You know, get out of here. The escape goat, the escaped goat. We'll let him out, throw rocks at him, send him out the village. As our way of appeasing the sociopath experienced in childhood, projected on the universe, and one less goat, one more ritual trauma, life goes on, it doesn't get better because life doesn't get better until competency goes up. And how competent are you if you blame a goat for a projected sociopathic father up in the sky and continue wandering around in circles in a desert expecting to find a home in the desert. A rainforest might have been a good idea, but you were listening to some dude, came down the mountain, follow me. So how smart were you 
to listen to that guy for 40 years. Well, you know, not smart enough to leave the desert, obviously. And so it's going to be another bad year, and there's going to be another goat. And, you know, we're far too sophisticated to bloody a goat, right? We just find one of our children and blame the entire family. In fact, we blame the entire dysfunction and stupidity of the entire cult onto this baby. You ruined my life. I was a free and happy person and then I had you. Now I have to stay with this bozo because oh, it's all for you. You ruined my life. Gosh, you know, let's see how much suffering we can throw on this child. Your father. Your mother did this. Uh, this. You know, you, you notice these parents, they're never adult enough to talk about their wife, their, their, their husband. You never have a healthy parent come up and say, you know, I don't really know much about things because I live in a dysfunctional cult that thinks algebra is more important than parental literacy, than trauma literacy, than emotional literacy, than relational literacy, than communication skills. So I decided to live with someone knowing absolutely nothing about anything, and the person I picked is from the same cult who knows absolutely nothing about anything. And then to complicate matters, uh, we decided to have sex without a condom because that's what other people do. We we're supposed to have children. And then you came along and we still don't know anything. And I chose him and I went along with this program of willful ignorance and sustained relational illiteracy. And I see you're not very happy with it. And why would you be? I don't know what I'm doing. And I mean, your, your father? I picked uh, a completely unconscious person. I'm so sorry for ruining your life. You know, we'd start to get a little somewhere if a parent actually said this. But no, your father, as if somehow the child chose the spouse for the partner and is completely responsible for everything the partner does and needs to be the one vented at because they're too small to fight back. So, every one of us here lacks a thousand hours of emotional literacy. Every one of us here lacks a thousand hours of traumatic literacy. We lack a lot of data. We don't even know what we're doing. And in the process, we are creating vast amounts of chronic and unnecessary suffering. And rather than admit that this is going on and tallying the data and doing scientific studies to say, okay, in this situation, active listening works. In this situation, it makes it worse. When both people are on the same page here, this works. When they're not, 58% of the time it doesn't. Know the data, study the data, participate in the data. But you see, the data reveals a very important truth about you, about me, about our parents, and about the cult. Namely, that we don't know what we're doing because we are spending more energy than any cult in human history. The average American will leave 100 tons in a landfill, 1,500 metric tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, participate directly and indirectly in the, in the consumption of 90,000 gallons of gasoline work harder, live in bigger houses, and make more money per capita than any cult in human history. 
and have high levels of addiction, of trauma, of incompetent grief, of sexual abuse, of depression, of varying mental emotional disorders, high levels of pain. In fact, the average person is carrying massive amounts of pain that neither they nor anyone around them is capable of effectively responding to. And because we believe in the paradigm of punishment and blame, rather than saying, well, of course, the Human Awareness Institute facilitators don't know what they're doing, raised in a cult that doesn't know what it's doing, of course, you and I haven't a clue what we're doing in an area we have received little or no formal training based on competence and a tremendous amount of brainwashing based on dogma and outright lies. Of course we don't know what we're doing. And of course our children will not know what they're doing learning what to, what not to do from us. Of course. And that will continue as a massive movement of energy, as a status quo with massive momentum until we, in a large enough mass to slow this pattern down, actually respond in a concerted way with disciplined force applied at the amount of pressure to pull the ever given out of the mud and start the flow. Not a little bit in our spare time. Hello, ever given. Give you a little push here. See you next week. You're not getting out anytime soon because two million pushes erratically from time to time guarantees sustained stuckness and the blockage of one of the major arteries of movement and energy on the planet rooting for you. No, it requires sustained intelligent response. And the child is incapable of doing that. And the adolescent is incapable of doing that. And in a cult that doesn't know how to initiate its adolescence into adulthood, most of us are traumatized children and adolescents without the vocabulary and awareness to even know what an adult is, let alone to respond with the competency needed to love as an adult, to love enough to care, to care enough to take time to take enough time to see, to see enough to understand, to understand enough, to understand, to stand under, to build the neuronal connections through mirror neurons enough that we have feelings about what we understand, that we empathize. And not just to say, I feel for you. I'm not gonna give you a penny. I'm not going to take a little moment off of my commute. I'm not going to do anything, I, but I really, really feel for you. I got to go. No, empathizing enough to attune, to adapt, to respond. That's what differentiates an adult from a child and adolescent. A child and adolescent can react, but they can't respond respond enough to attune, to attune. You see, hundreds of tons could have, or tugboats could have descended on the ever given, clear like 
every psycho psychologically illiterate American that they know what they're doing before they even understand what the task is. I know, I know, don't tell me, I know, I knew that already. You see, in a chauvinistic cult, the feminine is devalued. In the polarity of knowledge, you have the known and you have the unknown. The, un the unknown is feminine, the known is masculine. The unknown is much bigger than the known. But if you lose cult rank status for not knowing, and you desperately need cult rank status because you have been dehumanized to such an extent through so many violations by giants that you could not defend yourself against, when you've been dehumanized to feeling so small you cannot bear to be present with your own terrified little boy who was left there alone by every one of the giants in more pain than he could carry. The compulsivity of lies. I know, I knew that. You see, if a hundred tugboats show up and ram into the Ever Given and push it deeper into the mud because they lack the competency to understand what they don't know they don't know, It's useless help. It's worse than nothing. But an American shame-based cannot hear that. They cannot hear that their help was worse than nothing. That they're not even at the level of not knowing what they don't know. There's too much shame there. There's too much blame and punishment there in a sociopathic cult that shames and punishes you for not knowing, that shames and punishes you for getting it wrong, but that won't teach you. I mean, if you're a cult that shames you for not knowing emotional literacy, you could at least teach students in high school a few hundred hours of emotional literacy, and then maybe there would be some justification in saying, well, gee, you don't know that? Why would you possibly know that? when you're surrounded by morons who don't know it and who don't know that they don't know it and who won't admit that they don't know that they don't know it because to do so is to take on the dogma of shame. There is no shame in not knowing, but there is a lot of pain in ignorance that leads to chronic failure that is denied and so it cannot change. The ship cannot be put back on its path because no one can face the incompetence involved in how it arrived there in the first place. I won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. I won't get near it because I only do things that I'm guaranteed to succeed at. And so I do meaningless things that I'm good at in a cult that teaches me how to do this and this, but doesn't teach me how to do what really matters, so I avoid them. Because I don't want to be blamed and punished. I'd rather just not try at all. So it's a difficult situation. At some level, the pain of not responding gets bigger than the pain, than the fear of pain, because all fear is fear of pain. All fear of pain correlates to incompetence. All pain is separation from and longing for something. I long to be loved, and I feel completely alone. There's a big gap there. I long to be tenderly caressed, and people look at me with disgust. There's a big gap there. I long, but I don't have. 
pain is a symptom of incompetence. And once you transcend the chauvinism of the individual obsession, because in the masculine feminine duality, you have the circle and the point. You have the community and the individual. In a highly chauvinistic cult, the individual is everything, the circle is nothing. And so it makes perfect sense to have millions of individuals violating and disregarding the circle in pursuit of their 100%. I'm not responsible, meaning I'm not able or willing to respond to the group, to the cult, to the culture, to the community. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. It has nothing to do with me. It's not my business. It's not my business. The more we sever ourselves from the underlying ecology out of which we emerge, the more we create the illusion of a wound that does not exist because it is a lie. You feel independent, try rejecting the gift of air provided every minute of your life from the trees. You feel independent, try giving up the gift of water provided every day of your life. Or the sun, or the gravitational field. Try surviving and just say, you know, gravitational field, I don't need you. I'm independent. I'm an American. Go fuck yourself. I don't need anyone. And float off into space without gravity. Lose all oxygen. And maybe you will discover a few ounces of humility in the last moments of asphyxiation. We are each deeply multidimensionally connected to the whole out of which we come and of which we are a part. We are so connected, in fact, that the whole cannot exist without everything in the whole. You don't get to delete gravity and the, the whole exists. You don't get to take energy and destroy it. No energy is created or destroyed according to physics. It's simply transformed. No energy is created or destroyed. It's simply transformed. We don't get to delete the world would be so much better if, because if we start unraveling the code, which of course is a counterintuitive science, since we don't do this, cults are based on dogma more than science. If we start erasing the code, we say that whites are better than blacks, for example, well, you take that to its natural conclusion and blacks should be exterminated, surely, if they're inferior. Why would you want something inferior? You just have a little bit of problem in the mathematics of reality. Since every human today is understood to have emerged out of the lands, in which black skin was normal. So if, at what point do you delete the blacks? Because if you go back to the origin of the entire species and delete the blacks, you're dead. Because your great, great, great grandmother was deleted by your stupidity. I mean, you made a big mistake. You thought that you were innately better 
than your grandmother, your great, 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 great grandmother. And it didn't work out very well because when you deleted her from the time equation, you started fading. So he said, oh, I can't do that. What about deleting bugs? No, oh, the whole planet is failing. You know, it's like it's, it's very difficult to edit an integrated ecology, which is why we use dogma rather than science for our isms, racism, chauvinism, capitalism, ageism, sexism. They don't work. I hate men. Great. Just delete them all for the last hundred million years and you and all your lazy friends vanish because you cannot you cannot leave the fruit. If you hate the papaya tree, you don't get to keep the papaya because the papaya comes from the papaya tree. It's the same the other way around. If we could just get rid of these women and have only men, well, where are those men going to come from? And how does it work philosophically to say that a man is better than a woman, but depends on a woman to exist? How do you figure that out? It's like saying four is better than two plus two. How do you figure that? Try taking one of the twos or two of the twos away and you have no four. You cannot say the present is better than the past if the present doesn't exist without the past. Power is the ability and willingness to respond. Empowerment is the ability and willingness to respond in such a way that your ideals, your vision, yours, I, ideals, your vision is realized. If you want to live in a cult of shame-based, highly secretive, fear-based, traumatized, frightened children and adolescents hurting each other in relationship of, in which parents molest their children emotionally and physically, in which rape goes on, you have to do absolutely nothing except apply cult dogma. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. It's not my business. Has nothing to do with me. And you too can be a child of your cult, unquestioning its dogmas. And each person and each thing that has nothing to do with you, according to the dogma, can deepen the illusion of isolation, the wound of separation, and you too can continue the experiment in isolation, in the obsession with the individual. That is the American cult knowing that according to anthropologists, 95% of all cults in human history are dead. 10,000 cults have, ro have roamed this planet in known history. 5% of those cults remain today. And every one of them throughout all history has been absolutely clear in the brainwashing of their children. Our cult, our dogmas, 
our unquestioned truths and our banished taboos are the only right ones. And every other cult on the planet today and throughout all time, they are wrong in a chauvinism that says there can only be one or the other. And if there can only be one, let's make it men. If there can be only one, let's make it our skin color, our cult. You see, that is what Mr. Chauvin believed. There could only be one on top. And so, naturally, a Frenchman, it had to be him. Mr. Chauvin believed it could be only one and it couldn't possibly be his wife. The only one that mattered in the relationship was his wife. Traumatized narcissists don't think like that. That would be irrational. No, of course, Mr. Chauvin knew it was him. And by extension, all men, all white men, And other people decided to listen to Mr. Chauvin. So we have rampant chauvinism. Mr. Chauvin didn't go to a scientist and say, uh, what do you think about this idea? I think men are more important than women. And I'd like to ignore the fact that all these important people are emerging and thus owe their life to all these people who have no value. And scientists would say, well, wasn't the, wasn't the whole point of the goose that laid the golden egg, wasn't that whole point about the fact that if you valued the gold, you valued the goose that laid the gold even more? Because without the goose, you don't get any gold? Wasn't the point that whoever possessed the goose was wealthier than anyone who possessed the egg? And wouldn't that suggest, Mr. Chauvin, that since you came out of the womb of a woman, that the woman was more valuable than the egg that she laid? Well, Mr. Chauvin didn't like this idea, so he didn't consult a scientist, certainly not a female scientist. Dogmatism doesn't require evidence. It just requires willful ignorance and chronic denial by a majority. And in the history of humanity, the majority has always been wrong relative to a select evolving minority on the bleeding edge of technology, be that financial, mental, sexual, spiritual, emotional technology. There is a small group of the most competent people throughout the entirety of history that on the bell curve of innovation and cultural adoption are leading the way because they are more competent in that area than everyone else, which is why intelligent cults honor and nurture their minorities. Because the majority is too ignorant to know which of its many minority subgroups are developing the technology that it cannot understand. So its best bet is to admit 
that it is too ignorant to make an assessment of which minority is going to lead the world in the latest technology and which minority is out to lunch. And so let's just nurture a diverse, healthy place for minorities to encourage competence and receive their blessing. Since a very small number of people have had more impact on the world we live in today than 80 or 90 percent of the population combined. What if it is our business? What if we do have the power to respond? What if our first business is to become educated enough to know where we don't know what we're doing, to become educated enough to find those who do know more of what they're doing than we do, and to love and care enough to champion leaders, scientists, educators, that embody best practices that will lead the way towards intelligence, towards grace, towards evolution, measured by the efficiency with which time, money, and natural resources are transformed into sustainable human well-being. Thank you.